Hey everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm James, that's Katie, and of course that makes this episode 36 of Circles and Squares, the PlayStation podcast. Uh, Kate, how are you? I'm great, I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I was, I, I don't know if you've, um, I, I think it's pretty popular out right there. I've been watching Queen's Gambit actually on Netflix, which oh. um, I, I thought was pretty cool, but it's got me just even more excited to watch the next Marvel show. You know, What If is coming out in just like, I think it's like four days from now recording on the 7th. And, you know, like getting into a series like that, I enjoyed Queen's Gambit. Fine. Just don't get me wrong. But whenever it's a Marvel one, especially with how good the shows have been recently, like I'm, I just can't wait for, to get more of that kind of content. Yeah, this one looks really cool. And I've enjoyed all the other ones, but this is probably the one that the um, the premise interested me the most. Like, it just is so, like, wacky, and it lets them be creative and tell just some, like, bizarre comic book stories. So mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. that will definitely be exciting in a few days. Yeah, Captain Carter. Man, that was good. There was that other trailer that dropped the other day. It just made me even more excited, you know. But, man, so close so far. It's one of those one mm-hmm. of those terrible, like, oh, I've been waiting so long kind of kind of situations. But... Um, yeah, let's talk about some video games in the meantime, hey? And uh, we'll we'll kill like a nice hour and a half doing this, and then that's one less hour and a half to wait for the show. So, um, hey, just before we get started, though, guys, we want to put out the call. We do a listener mail question at the end of every episode, and we're running really low on the mailbag, um, like freakishly low, you know? We're running the scraping the bottom of the barrel for questions, and we would really appreciate it, anyone listening out there. Send us in a question, guys. Anything video game related uh, could even be related to other stuff, I guess. We just talked about Marvel, so send us any kind of questions you want. Um, we really genuinely love getting getting the listener questions and just seeing kind of what you guys come up with, thinking of fun answers. So, um, yeah, send us uh, listener mail questions over to circlesandsquarespod at gmail.com um, or to our Twitter account at CNSPod. We can answer them there, too. Um, but to get into the show today, Kate, we will, of course, be doing uh, starting the show with what we've been playing, including a follow up on Plague Tale, which we talked about last time. And we've both beaten the game since then. Um, and then we'll move over into the news section, uh, which is pretty jam packed for this month. And finally, start uh, finish the show, sorry, with the third section, which will be a collection of games we'd recommend for people to take to an abandoned desert island, um, have some fun categories and talk about some good games over there. Um, so let's get started, Kate. Let's talk about the games we've been playing. Uh, and the first up is something from the Annapurna showcase that came out a couple of days ago. Uh, we both played the demo for Storyteller, which came up on Steam. Um, we both played it the last couple of days. This is a very interesting puzzle game um, from Annapurna. And they've done a lot of these in the past. They did Gora Goa, Journey, um, What Remains of Edith Finch. They published all of those. So this is another one that's very much along the lines of uh, it's a cool puzzle game with some unique mechanics, and you're basically filling in comic panels with different characters and and um, backgrounds, and then they which causes them to interact differently, and um, you have to kind of complete an objective that's given to you at the top. And I I really enjoyed this a lot. I think that f- figuring out um, you know some of the puzzles and how to get the characters to interact in the way that they want you to was just uh, very very enjoyable. And I really am looking forward to this game kind of out of nowhere all of a sudden. Yeah, I think this game is is really creative and it's also really impressive. It's smart. So, uh like you said, like it it's kind of hard to to picture but like just hearing about it because it's obviously a very visual game. But you get those comic panels and say you have like six panels and you have to do like a heartbreak scene or something. And so like your resources you're given are like a couple different backdrops, a couple different characters, and so you can slide them into these panels and you have to tell that kind of a story um but the game is is very smart at making the context happen depending on what you what you've told so far in the story so for example like you have your two characters you'll make them meet first you can give them a backdrop where if you put both of them in in like a wedding hall then they would get married or fall in love kind of thing and then you'll get like a backdrop later that's like you can like um like a graveyard kind of thing and you one of your characters dies then if it's the people that got married they'll be heartbroken but if you just have slotted those people in without already having set up in the story that they had had a romance then that scene wouldn't happen yeah there's a level of continuity that that comes up like if someone dies in in panel two if you put that same character in panel six, they appear as a ghost because they're dead and there is a revival background that you can do to, to bring someone back if you need to, but you'd have to put them in that state before you can continue on like completing whatever objective that you want. 
And so, so yeah, like to illustrate what you were kind of talking about, there's one of the early stages just to illustrate is someone drinking poison out of being heartbroken. So the first scene, there's a three panel layout they give you to complete it. The first scene, you put the backdrop of marriage and you have this, uh, this couple that gets married, the the heart appears, they're all in love. And then the second uh, panel will be uh, in the, in the church again, they're getting married, but this time you have a third character you can put in who, um, if you put her alongside one of the people that got married, She'll be heartbroken because, oh, the person I love, I guess, is is already married. So then in the third panel, you can use the other background that they give you, which is, uh, I guess it's like a cellar. There's some jars of poison and whatnot. And so it's called poison. You put the heartbroken girl in there. And then because uh, she wasn't able to marry the person she loved, she will then drink the poison in the final panel and uh, you complete the level. So and they obviously get a lot more complex. There's like characters putting on costumes, characters reviving from the dead um dracula's in the game you can turn people into vampires it it goes in some pretty crazy places and i can only imagine after playing the demo um how complex i think a lot of these puzzles will probably get yeah exactly and as a cute point you touched on with dracula being there is that they uh, quite a few of the scenarios especially the later ones in the demo that got a little bit more complicated were very much based off of other well-known stories so yeah we had dracula and you know turning the the girl into a vampire and the guy having to like try to get that reversed and there obviously the poison there was a romeo juliet kind of scene so that's kind of cute too if you're familiar with these stories trying to like put those puzzles together but at the same time it seems like the game does a good job of being relatively flexible like i would solve it a certain way but then i was curious as well just to see if i could solve the puzzle in, in multiple ways and especially with some of the ones that were more complicated at the end, there were a few different things I tried to switch out in my story and I was able to come to the correct conclusion and fulfill like the requirements of like it's this type of story, but in various creative ways. So I think the game seems like it has a lot of potential for like, there's a lot of resources it gives you but you can be creative in how you kind of complete the story and you can't just do anything you want, right? Like you can't make any character drink poison just for the sake of drinking poison because they'll look at you and be like, I don't have a motivation for doing this. Like you have to set up a reason why they're like depressed or like something has happened <laughs> prior to this that now they think, you know, like maybe they would have a motivation to do it. So you can't just, it's smart enough that you can't just like put random stuff, but it is like clever enough as well to be able to understand what you're trying to do and everything I went for the game picked up on and was like yep I understand what you're going for and like this is how it would play out so I mean obviously it was a demo and there were a lot of showcasing how the game could work but I, I do see this having a lot of potential for some really like long creative panels in the future. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's any potential for like linking stories so would things carry over from like this set of chapters you could go through where you know the first set of panels someone you know you know like the, the continuous nature of like panel to panel i wonder if there could be like story to story just spitballing an idea really but yeah i, I mean like you said the the level of logic i think that this kind of takes is it was it was just kind of a perfect difficulty for me at least the levels they displayed mm -hmm. here it built you up really nice in terms of you know keeping it very simple at the start um, learning how to kind of put in the backgrounds and the characters. And by the end, it was a lot more complex than where you started, but you felt like it was a nice progression. So I'm uh, just hoping it continues that way for the full game, really. I think it's uh, Steam and Switch later this year, um, hopefully on the PlayStation later on for, for everyone on uh, more of our audience, I guess. But um, I'll be playing it for sure one way or another. I think it'd be great on Switch, actually, like kind of... Um, yeah. the handheld nature and then also with the touch screen would be great kind of laying in bed or whatever you yeah do. exactly because the, the gameplay basically like what you're doing is you're just dragging and dropping things that's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the extent of it right like it's clever and, and it's it's really engaging but the actual like mechanics of it is drag and drop so um oh yeah i wish list on steam just because that's a convenient way to keep track of games coming out for me but like i think i will definitely pick this up and and having it on something like switch would be awesome it would work really well as a mobile game too actually I bet it comes to mobile at one point. I mean, it's got to, right? Like it's such a big audience and it's, it's the kind of thing where it would translate so well. Like it would, it would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would definitely recommend anyone go to go try that demo if, if you're into like puzzle games or just even like really creative kind of like palette cleanser indie experiences. And I think it's, it's definitely a game I'm going to have my eye on going forward. Yeah, same here. And uh, the last thing I wanted to shout out and then we can move along is uh, just something I think it, it that is 
really should be commended a lot of games when they do this this game does not have any care at all like who's marrying who who's killing who who's jealous of who um mm-hmm. you can put two women at the marriage two guys two whoever you want um i don't know about dracula but you know anyone who's <laughs> maybe a human um i really like the way it doesn't doesn't force you into like the guy has to marry the girl kind of stuff so i think that's um really positive big step forward and yeah shout out to storyteller for that um anyway kate let's move along we got to talk about plague tale again because uh, we had some some stuff to say about it last time on the show for those who listened to our last episode and we've both beaten the game since i think we were about halfway through um last time when we talked and so i mean listening back to that episode when i when i went to edit it and we submitted it online and whatnot i i feel like we came across or at least i came across quite negative on it and i think it's the nature of like when you talk about something you're enjoying but it's it's easier to talk about the things that you don't like as much compared to the things you like right and i don't know like i feel like after finishing this game i'm definitely warmer on it than i was maybe in the first half i think it's a lot stronger in the second half like the puzzle complexity really builds up um the story goes in some really creepy and genuinely very dark places yeah i mean i i'm i'm a lot more positive than i thought um initially for sure and i'm curious to see what you think about this we've we've not really talked too much about it since since we finished it so what are your what are your thoughts now that you've kind of had time to digest um yeah i I think i'm 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 with you in agreement that i i don't want to come off too negative about this game because i genuinely think that asobo has done something really special here And I think what they focused on was the world and the story. And I think those aspects, they nailed. I was so invested in the characters, specifically Amicia and Hugo by the end of it. Um, There was a point where I was talking to someone about the game and I was maybe like three quarters of the way through. And I was was just chatting like, how's the game? And I told them, I was like, honestly, if something happens to Hugo, I will be devastated. Like, I am so protective of this child. (laughs) (laughs) I am Amicia. Exactly. Like, I care about him so much. And I I think what they focus on, what they set out to do, they accomplished, like, fantastically. I do, however, maintain that there are some parts of this game that are a little bit rough around the edges. For sure. And I think it's a shame that there were just a few sections and aspects of the game that I found frustrating or pulled me out of the immersion. And I maintain that I think this game is great. I think it's a great game. But I think the game could have been phenomenal and like a top tier game for me. And I, I think it's a shame that it was just kind of held back a little bit and that my experience wasn't positive all of the time um but at the same time i i did want to mention too that i think coming into it i had the wrong sort of impression as to what kind of a studio sobo was they're quite a small studio like they've done mostly like i mean they worked on flight simulator which is really cool but most of their stuff is kind of like movie tie-in games and just some sort of like small scale stuff Mm -hmm, so this mm -hmm. was a really big like different like departure from what they're used to they're not a very big team and i think like what they managed to pull off is incredibly impressive i think i and i think it's unfair that a lot of places have compared this game to like the last of us and like those kind of storytelling like character drawn gate or character driven games because they just don't have anywhere near the kind of resources that yeah. someone like naughty dog has and what they managed to do with their limited resources was really impressive. So coming, like keeping that in mind and just having that as the perspective, I think was also really important to be like, you know what, if there's a couple rough things and, you know, if it, there's like a little bit of like something that's a little glitchy or if, if you have a character that sort of bugs out for a second, like, yeah, that's going to happen, right? Like, yeah. it, it doesn't ruin the game and it doesn't mean that they didn't accomplish what they tried to do and it wasn't a really well-crafted game. Right. I, I think the reason it draws a lot of comparison to like The Last of Us, God of War is because it's the idea that you're playing as an older character chaperoning someone less experienced. Mm-hmm. But so I guess it's yeah. kind of taking that formula, but is applying it to a, a smaller scale experience. Right. Um, yeah, I, f- I found like this definitely the story in the world. Last time, one of my bigger gripes was I didn't buy a lot of the relationships between the characters, I think. Um, I still kind of kind of maintain that to some extent, like a lot of the I, I, I definitely buy 
Amicia and Hugo a lot more towards the end of the game. Like I, and especially, um, spoiler spoilers are going to be ahead by the way, now that we finished the game, I think we should, we should talk about it. Spoiler, spoiler, um, I think so. included. So just be aware of that. But I mean, by the end of the game, I think I bought their relationship a lot more. It was a lot of the side characters, like those twins and, um, Roderick, the blacksmith. I, I kind of was like, why are they so devoted to this? cause kind of mm-hmm. out of nowhere like i don't know like obviously it's a smaller game like we said they didn't maybe it would have been bogged down if they spent so much time kind of developing more of those relationships but um i think the characters were fine i think the, like you said the world specifically i think we we said this last time too but doubling down is is just it's an amazing world like it's honestly one of my i, I don't know say favorite ever but it's one of my more favorite settings for a game i've seen in quite a while and, and like especially those scenes of the the um when you go back to amicia's house after the infestation or the plague is kind of taken hold and there's those big like just piled up i don't even know what they are they're like rotten black kind of veiny um just like decay the, and mold i think and, it's like the nest the rats yeah, build and like where they live and like how much they've taken over and like it's so oh, unsettling just, like, it looks it just really gross. like you wouldn't want to walk and you're walking over dead bodies and there's pools of blood in the, on the ground and just endless carcasses of like people and oh Man, Absolutely, it's, it's like dark. they do not pull their punches in this game. Like this is the kind of game where, like, I I think this will stick with me and I will always remember it because they just did something that no one else has really attempted before, and they didn't ha- half commit. They wasn't. It wasn't like you know they you try to make a point, but then it's like well, we better throw in a joke and like make sure it's it's fun and like everyone can enjoy it. Like no, it was dark and like you're you come across a field and it's just bodies just piled and like it it doesn't shy away from a lot of these darker things and it's your only way forward and your characters have to to basically walk over all of these these dead people and it's it's horrible and it makes you go through it it doesn't flash over it in a cutscene quickly like you are stuck there with the characters well I there was one point when you're in this kind of bigger outdoor area and the rats start coming out of the ground. And I don't know, maybe you found a different route through it than I did. But the way I kind of a- approached it, I was going around this left-hand side. And my um, my goal was like, okay, there's there's this pile of dead bodies, or like, a, like a pool of blood or something I had to walk through. And I was hoping to avoid that and kind of also get through the rats. But the way the rats were positioning themselves... The game, really, I honestly had no I, no other option than to walk through like this gross mass of this decaying corpses and all this. And it was just like, man, th- this is a choice you really would have to make if you were in this situation. Like realistically, the rats will kill you. So so you have to walk over these mm-hmm. corpses. And like the game really makes it feel like the dual sense as well, like makes it feel like you're kind of in this sloppy sloppy setting it's, it does a really really good job with that i i can't shout it out enough like it it really makes you feel the atmosphere in this game especially towards the end when things really start going to shit like with a lot of the rats everywhere um yeah it's it's it does a great job I, I wanted to ask you um and maybe we can get a bit more into the mechanics because i know i think we can both agree that's kind of our one of our united areas is that i think it could be more fun plainly mechanically a lot of the slingshot mm-hmm. stuff um, what did you think of the boss fights in this game? Um, as far as like breaking the armor off those big guys and, and like the, the one at the end where you're avoiding big pillars of rats coming down. Like what, what did you think of the, the more combat scenarios like that? Um, so I, I enjoyed the boss fights itself or themselves. I wasn't a fan of combat sections in the game. That was my biggest issue with it. So the boss fights were, were kind of cool. It was really strange actually, because I don't know if, if they changed their vision partway through or or what happened but at the very beginning of the game you have a boss fight pretty early on and it involves you kind of like using your sling to knock the guy's armor off until eventually his head is exposed so that you can kill him um because how you fight in this game essentially is you sling rocks at guys heads and, and that's you never miss you never miss as long as you're locked on i miss as long as you're locked on you never miss i miss locking on new story um so and that happens pretty early and, and while you're knocking his armor off you have a dodge button and so you're sort of dodging his swings and that kind of because it's so early on and it's almost like a tutorial of how to fight this boss i was unsure where they would necessarily come into it but it gives you the impression you're going to be fighting a lot of bosses in the game but there's three there's bosses like three, yeah there's three bosses total and the other two don't really play similarly to the first one 
so that was a little bit strange um seemed like some the, cut content there maybe you know yeah maybe or maybe just you know well, they're building a sequel so perhaps that'll come into it more later i don't know but um the final boss i really liked it was mm -hmm. a super cool spectacle um it kind of put together all of the things that you've built up so far and it was you know using the because you kind of without trying to spoil too i mean this is definitely spoiling but you get the rat sort of oh, on we're, your we're side spoiling, you, hugo is able to control it that's kind of like where the the mystery comes into it is that there's something in his blood that he's connected to the rats and that's why he's been sick um but he learns to harness that and is able to use the rats to his advantage so you control them so it, it kind of is a combination of using those rats and also using your slingshot so it was kind of a cool boss and it was just really over the top cinematic and like the amount of like rats on screen in that fight was insane well especially because the what's his name the minister guy the head of the church the evil guy obviously because the mm -hmm. church is obviously the evil entity whenever <laughs> there's a story like this there's no doubt and the way that he gets those that white set of rats that kind of competes because of all that stuff that happens in the story like seeing that that on screen at the same time with the black ones and this huge kind of climactic mm. ending the fight like it was it was really cool it was a huge spectacle um for sure and yeah, I, turned... I really wanted to kill that guy by the end like fuck that guy oh god that guy was yeah that guy was the worst he was such a prick he was like <laughs> and he was old too like come on man you've had your time <laughs> trying to steal a kid's blood so you can stay alive longer come on yeah that's one of those things it's hard to justify a villain when his like main plan is like i need to steal this kid's blood it's like hmm yeah, that's pretty dark <laughs> wonder who the bad guy is <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah you kick his ass in the end and that's cool um the boss fight in the middle was probably the weirdest one for me like it's just sort of this like slow hulking knight guy who's like I'm, I'm here to kill you but i i have like really bad knees so <laughs> yeah so i'm slow as hell like, and like we'll never catch really you slowly and like the mechanic is sort of cool like you need to extinguish his fire so that you can get the rats then to go attack him and like it, it's a cool set, but I just feel like I spent 80% of the match just sort of like running away from him until I could get the right setup of fire mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. rats and like he just slowly plods after you. So I don't know necessarily how much like I don't know. It was fine. But to me, like the best parts of the game to play, like obviously the story was the main draw, but the best parts, what I enjoyed playing the most was the puzzle solving because a lot of the stealth sections get really interesting as you go on later when you have the guards you're dealing with, but you also have an environmental puzzle of like, how am I going to deal with the rats? So yeah. that was my favorite gameplay was that kind of like halfway to like three quarters of the way through where you don't have any rat powers yet. So the rats are like a massive threat um, and you need to get around them. So you're moving light sources and you're you're clearing a path through them, but you're also having to get around soldiers, so you can't just, like, move around freely. And there's a lot of ways that you can combine the two, so you can either try to sneak by the soldiers, or you can, like, manipulate the light so that they end up getting killed by the rats, and then you move the light then to make a path for yourself. And I felt like there was a lot of creativity that I could use to get through things and like mm -hmm. i don't mm -hmm. think the first half was necessarily bad in the sense of like there's usually one solution like i don't think that's wrong i think it's equally as interesting to figure out that a, a puzzle in the way of when it has a solution you got to figure out what you need to do i think that's totally valid gameplay i think that's fun i don't think necessarily like lack of choice should be demonized as much as it is but as long as it it's is done quality quality right and yeah. i think it is for the most part like the, the yeah. puzzles for the most part are pretty interesting both ways in this game i would say yeah it's more the exactly. more like the, the feeling of pulling them off and the mechanics of doing it that maybe is the part where we could see some improvement yeah exactly but then it, it just it does a good job i think of building on itself and kind of adding in a lot of different aspects and then by the end of it even if maybe there is only one way to do it, it really does feel like you're you're kind of figuring it out as as you go along and and using all of your resources. So, mm -hmm. and how did how did you feel about collecting all those resources and everything too? Because I I feel like the game would be largely the same if there was no crafting or like resource management, really at all. Because the game gives you everything you need for each specific sequence, right? Because it couldn't lock you in place and make you so like oh you really you know you need um, some fire here some to, to build the fire ammo to get past this puzzle well it can't lock you out of having that it has to give it to you and i just feel like 
maybe you're it's bogged down a bit too much by that and like the crafting and everything like i didn't really notice it's not like i was ever like looking forward to like oh i can't wait to upgrade my sling you know it's going to make this so much easier <laughs> like it was just kind of one of those things sure i did it but did i really notice the specific changes maybe not really aside from the ammo capacity and stuff but um yeah, interesting I, I think it may be like yeah i don't think it would have changed much if it wasn't there i think because with that kind of system like it encourages you to explore and to kind of like check every nook and cranny um but they also had stuff in the game which i don't think we touched on last time but i quite enjoyed of like little like secrets you could find so there was like a compendium of like various things and i'm a big sucker when games do that and it's like you'll find different historical objects or different like flowers or various things and then when you find them you get a little like brief description of of what they meant in that historical context so like this is this flower and like what people believed that it would it would bring good luck in this way or something or like this is a a document from that time and and this is what it meant so like i i love that that really like gives me all the encouragement i need to check everything because i want to find all of those and i want to stop and like read a little history textbook every 30 seconds (laughs) i love that so I didn't need to find crafting material because I was already interested in doing that. Um, but at the same time, like, it didn't necessarily put me off that I was finding them. I was, I guess I'm pretty neutral towards it. Like, it didn't I've put people... me off. It, it just seemed a bit, a bit uh, less important, you know, like, mm-hmm. like you always have the stuff you're going to need to solve the puzzle because they have to give it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as far as the crafting goes, I don't like, I don't know. It, it wasn't bad. It just felt like you kind of just did it because it was there. It didn't add add a lot to like to the experience, I guess, in the same way as like, oh, if I've crafted a silencer for my gun in The Last of Us, so now this is going to be completely different because I can stealth it or something, you know? Yeah, that's fair. It was a very like mild version of something like that. And I guess it was interesting since every now and again, I'd be like, oh, what can I craft? And I would stop and look. But other than that, like it almost kind of fit the theme more of like an alchemist in, mm-hmm. in the sense of like, well, there's a lot of alchemy in the game and, and you have to learn how to craft these different potions. And then once you know them, you can create like something that makes fire or something that puts out fire, like various different things. Burns like, a guy's helmet off. I, I guess like the crafting is there more in the, to have the context of like, oh, I have these ingredients. I can now make this sure. alchemy potion. And so like, maybe that's more interesting than just like, oh, I just have unlimited fire to throw. And that's, that's like, that's true. That's true. I mean, maybe my, you know, maybe I'm not mad. There's a crafting system. I just think maybe it could be more interesting for like the upgrades that you get. Yeah, I I agree. They definitely could have utilized it more. But at the same time, I would rather the way that it is than the actual scarcity of items because mm-hmm, that would have mm-hmm. been just frustrating to have to deal with. So yeah, either way, I don't know. I, I really like this game. I'm glad I played it. I, I'm excited for the second one now too, to see um, kind of what they could do. Did, did you have any anything else you wanted to bring up about Plague Tale? Um, yeah, and I wanted to see if you had this experience because maybe I'm just really, maybe I missed something, but I had a couple times, and this is the, the only times that I was really, like, frustrated with this game, and this is what kind of drags me down from being, like, so close to being perfect, but there were a couple sections where you have, like, streams of guards running at you, and one of your companions is, like, they're picking a lock, or they're, they were, like, pushing something heavy out of the way or they're doing something that requires you to wait for them and guards come and it's your job to like protect them and so that involves like throwing three rocks at three guys that are coming and you kill them and that's great and there were just times where like i i had to redo those sections a few times and it got frustrating because i didn't feel like i was in a ton of control over like aiming and using the sling so it's fine in moments when you're stealthing or because the gameplay is slow like the enemies are moving very slowly and predictably and you're like doing the same but when they're running at you the only way to fire your sling is you have to lock on first you can't just aim wherever you want because even if your rock goes through them it doesn't count as mm-hmm, a connection mm-hmm. like it has to be it, spun up in the sling first to a certain speed yeah exactly and even if you like just sit and sling it if like you're not locked on like it doesn't matter that is how the game detects if you've made an attack or not so you lock on but once you're locked on you can't move where you're targeting because it's just that guy's head 
And so that means you can't lead your target. So I found oftentimes I would have my lock on, it was clearly on his head, I'd throw the rock, and then the rock would miss because he'd keep running and mm. he'd be running like faster than the how where it took the rock to travel. So the rock would miss and then he'd run up and kill me. Interesting. <laughs> wow. I I don't know if there was something I I genuinely don't know if there's something I was doing wrong because like, I don't know how many other people had this issue, but there were multiple times like I don't know how to fire this rock differently because it's lock on and shoot. But I can't hit the guy because he's running. <laughs> and so I almost found that like in some of these combat sections, I had to find the right place to stand so that they were like running at me mm -hmm. so that the rock would like go be going straight and to hit him. If they were running to the side, well, he would have run like more to the left and the rock would just like throw where he was a couple steps ago. And yeah. so I almost found that like you had to make sure you were positioned in the right place. Otherwise, the rocks wouldn't hit. And there were just like a few sections in particular where I was like, oh, I really love you game. Like, please don't do this to me. But it's not fun to do this six times over when like, I don't feel like I could be doing anything differently. Like maybe I'll stand two steps to the right. Like, please work. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I don't know. I just, I feel like if they fixed that, I would give this game like a 10 out of 10. But it just, it didn't feel good. And it was it became frustrating and I just wish that system had controlled slightly better. I agree with you. And I think, I think I had some similar issues. I feel like we probably, I feel like your experience was maybe a little bit more frustrating than mine. And I don't think it's maybe cause I'm better. Like, like you said, there was some, some situations and I, a couple of those scenes you're talking about, there definitely is better places to stand because if the enemies are running kind of left to right, good luck locking onto them. They have to be running at you. And so maybe mm -hmm. I just was standing in a better spot, but I, I agree with you. There was some times when I had to redo sections a few times, right? And the, the problem is too, is there's some really like long dialogue sections you have to re-listen to over and over sometimes. Um, but that's besides the point. With the lock on stuff though, I I feel like the way I would describe it would be a little bit different than you. Like if I was locked on, I feel like I didn't miss. Like, I, I don't know if it's possible if I was locked on, but what happened to me a lot of the time was the game will be locked on, locked on, locked on. And then all of a sudden it just kind of unlocks. And I had a lot of times when I'm just making sure I'm lining my shot up and then it would unlock as I was releasing the slingshot and I would miss as well. So, or like, or the enemy would move and become unlocked when I wasn't expecting it. Like the lock on isn't permanent, right? The, mm -hmm. If you slip, if you spin the slingshot for too long, she kind of, I guess she loses accuracy or gets tired or something, whatever the mechanic is. But, um, it definitely, it definitely didn't feel as good as it could have. I, I totally agree. Like I, if I was to say anything for what I'd be looking for out of the, the sequel to this game would just be keep the same setting, you know, build on the characters, build on the story you're telling, but just, I, I feel like if the, if the movement and kind of the, the combat and the action parts were juiced up a little bit and made to feel a little bit more smooth um something like you know an, a, like a tomb raider or like uncharted kind of controls like i know it's a smaller studio probably won't get there but something more along the lines of that type of movement with a little bit more freedom um it would be yeah like you said like close to 10 out of 10 like great great game for sure mm -hmm. yeah i think that's fair and i definitely like i don't want to sound too negative again i really like this game Hugo is one of my favorite characters in the world. Like, he's just the sweetest <laughs> little kid. And even when he's acting like a little shit, like, you know, like, he went through some hard times. He's five. Like, yeah, he was a... Traumatic. Pretty traumatic. Like, the voice acting was amazing and really, like, made those characters feel real. I think the game is fantastic. I think they have a really interesting relationship. I'm 100% on board. I just really feel like maybe give me a bow next time i don't know maybe the sling's just not a good weapon for me i agree I, I don't know the sling yeah give me a bow give me like a dagger you know sneak up behind you know people what? combat you don't like even that. know i like i like the sling i thought it was cool and different like i actually genuinely like that sling. Unique, i don't want right? it to be replaced it's unique and it just adds another thing like well this game is really different like i've never played anything like it i don't think i could find in a game that feels like it and that's great like the plague is such a horrible and like interesting time period and the fact that no games really like attempt working around it is actually strange after having played plague tale because like it's just it's not it's not even like an obscure setting it's quite well known it's just i feel like the plague whenever it shows up in games and don't quote me on this because it's not like i have an example sitting here but it's like if you're playing a game that has kind of that medieval setting 
that there would just be a town maybe that is having a plague or something in, in like Skyrim, you know, but it wouldn't be like the plague isn't setting. It's just like, oh, there are rats in this town and it's infested. Yes. Oh, please, please come back later. We're currently having a yeah. plague. <laughs> We've got a spot of plague over here. Just come back in three weeks. Yeah. yeah but. Oh, well, that's that's uh, that's Plague Tale, I guess. Go play it. It's, it's a really good game. Uh, it's yeah. on PS Plus, obviously. So no, you yeah. know what? Is, well, actually, it's it's free on Epic right now, too. So you really have no reason not to pick it up. If you somehow missed it on PlayStation, it is like the free Epic offering right now. So like, go play it. It is so worth it. But be patient. Be patient with it. Exactly. Um, with that being said, Kate, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back in just a few seconds with the news. So please uh, don't go anywhere. We'll talk to you in just a sec. All right, everyone, welcome back to the second part of today's show, which, as usual, is the news section. And we've got quite a bit of news to talk about this week, so we'll dive right into it. Of course, starting out with PlayStation Plus for August 2021. Um, for those listening for the first time, every single month, Kate and I pick a couple, one or two of the PS Plus games. Uh, we give them a try and give them you guys a quick review on the next episode to let you know what we thought. And so the games for this month are uh, the PS5 game is Hunter's Arena Legends. Um, love that legend subtitle so unique um and then the ps4 offerings are plants vs zombies battle for neighborville and tennis world tour 2 uh so interesting selection here hunter's arena was on uh was sh was shown off of that showcase last month so kind of yeah. cool we're getting to play that so soon after seeing it um i'm pretty excited to check that out honestly and i've heard some good stuff about plants vs zombies i know it sounds a bit weird like is that i mean i love the original plants vs zombies apparently this one's all right and then we got Tennis World Tour, which, you know, tennis fans rejoice. So, yeah, what do you think, Kate? What, what are you going to play? This is a weird one for me because none of these games are like, oh, my God, I really wanted to play that or stand out. Like, Plague Tale was like, when we had last month, was like, oh, shit, this is great because that's a game I've been wanting to, to pick up and now it's convenient. So not a single one of these games is ever something that I think I would buy. But I think this might be the first month where I'm like, I will try all of these games. <laughs> <laughs> and... Maybe partially it helps August. I'm going to, I got a little bit of a vacation from school, so I got a little extra free time. Um, but Plants vs. Zombies is something I've never played, and it's just like a quick, like, can play for an hour, so why not check it out? Um, tennis World Tour, I have no idea what a tennis game would look like, and I just want to see if I could make it as fun as, as Wii Sports. So I, I'm going to go, I'm going to play it just exactly with that. Like, is this as fun as Wii Sports? Yes or no? Yeah. Um, and then Hunter's Arena, I, I genuinely think would be fun to like sit down and play it because it, it looks like it has some potential to be really cool. Yeah, it looks interesting. I was watching some videos of it yesterday and I, I, I wouldn't say it looks, I mean, I, this is YouTube, of course, it'll look better on the, on the console when you're playing it, but I wouldn't say it's like super standout in the terms of way, it, the, like the graphic style, the art style. Um, but I mean, it looks like fun enough to play. It's, there's something fun about those co-op games where you go in and it's got, I think it's got PVE and PVP aspects to it as well. So if you get a good squad, you know, it could be fun. Um, maybe we'll try all three of these out. You never know. I, I could be down for like a match of tennis. Uh, check it out, you know, <laughs> Plants vs. Zombies, same thing. We'll, we'll see what we think of these on the next episode. Um, so anyway, let's move along to our second story, Kate. And this one is, uh, also PS Plus related. And it is that for the first time, Sony's PlayStation Plus subscriber count has dropped. Uh, they've lost 1.3 million subscribers, I guess, as of this month uh, when the when the new numbers came in. And so um, just wanted to throw this in there more so kind of out of out of interest, just because the first time ever the Play PlayStation Plus subscribers have dropped. That's a bit uh, of, of a unique thing to happen, honestly. Is this something you think we should be con like, is it concerning that people are dropping off a of PS Plus? Like for me, it's like I wonder how many people just kind of bought a, a PlayStation during quarantine got some kind of year subscription when they first bought it and then just haven't renewed it because people are more out and about now, you know, not maybe not at home as much as they were during the, the pandemic. So maybe that's got something to do with it. But uh, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I feel like this is like kind of a little like clickbaity of a, of a title. And because I read elsewhere and I, I can't remember exactly where I read it. So take it with a grain of salt. But I read that like compared to 2019's numbers, um, 2021 is actually like totally fine mm -hmm. and maybe like still even in the positive. I, so I think that it's more so not like 
the context is more like so many extra people signed up in 2020 because everyone had to stay at home and like had all this extra free time and like was not working and so I think it was I think the context is more like 2020 was outrageous and now like 2021 is sort of normalizing a bit so like yeah I guess it's too bad that maybe some of those extra people who signed up that normally wouldn't didn't stick around after but I think like the idea that like oh no Sony's lost so many subscribers like are they in trouble I think is like a little bit of like you know like it click media like, just like yeah kind of like a media headline so yeah that's true that's true I, I i don't see it going down honestly like i mean i guess there's always a, a discussion that could always come up around this topic of like is ps plus a good enough value when you compare it to something like game pass and you can have that whole argument i think they're different services um i mean ps mm -hmm. plus could always get better of course like I, I wonder how long it is that we're still people still will have to pay this to play online like i know i think certain games like fortnite actually have changed now so you don't have to actually have a subscription and i think xbox has moved away from having to have games with gold to play online too if i got that right so i wonder if that's kind of becoming a little bit archaic or people don't really see it being worth paying for ps plus like for that feature but i mean that's, that's a future topic i guess mm -hmm. um yeah i wouldn't be too worried about ps plus though you're probably right uh, so let's move along then, shall we? Which is our next news story. Um, little unfortunate news, but you know, these delays happen a lot these days. Uh, Kina Bridge of Spirits is delayed. I'm sorry, Kate. We bought you this game for your birthday a couple months back, and you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to play this, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But like we always say, I think it's better to delay a game than um, either put, this, put the studio through a stupid amount of crunch or release something that's not ready. So um, a, a sad news nonetheless, though. Yeah, it's too bad. I've still got that gift card. Yeah, you bought me a gift card specifically, and it, it has it written on there that it specifically is for, is it Kina or Kenna? I never know. I, I, um, I like I like Kina, but who knows? No, you said Kina, but um, anyway, bri someone's bridge of spirits. <laughs> that gift card specifically, that's what it says on it. So I haven't used it. I've saved it. I'm going to be playing this game day one, so I'd much rather play it in September day one when it works nicely. So eh, kind of a shame, but I'm still looking forward to it. I, it's the second delay this game's had as well. And I think it just speaks mm -hmm. to like how tumultuous it is to develop games at this time where we're at, you know, like just making sure. And it's not only the pandemic, it's also like stuff that happened to Cyberpunk, like a game being delay, uh, released and like and clearly not being where it needed to be. And so I think there's there's a bit maybe of a push of like, hey, you know, we really got to make sure that there's nothing like game breaking in these games these days when they come out. And so not that I would expect that from something like Kenna, but, uh, you know, it's another wrinkle on top of the pandemic, I guess stuff like that as well mm -hmm. um our last news story of the day kate uh it's exciting no, new legends of tsushima uh standalone version is announced alongside the new ghost of tsushima director's cut um a lot of new information coming out we talked about ghost of tsushima it seems like every episode uh we have something about ghosts <laughs> coming up but uh it's exciting news i'm really excited about there's a few different things to pick apart i guess in this uh kind of drop of tsushima news my my f biggest takeaway though is that legends is is becoming standalone I think that just shows kind of the success they've had with that mode. Maybe maybe some unexpected successes. I know it's, it's a side mode to the to the main game of Tsushima, but people really like Legends. I mean, we really enjoyed it. We've spoken about how we played with the guys over at Loud Thumbs quite a bit, and uh, it's just a great mode. I'm glad it's going to be presented to people who, you know, oh, Tsushima is a full price game, don't really want to buy it. Well, hey, play Legends uh, for this discounted price for the multiplayer mode. Like maybe that'll get people into the single player as well. Um, I just think it's great. This is going to be more accessible and, and, uh, people can have more fun with it. Yeah, I think it's awesome. And I think they also mentioned too, there's actually new modes coming to legends as well. So it will be standalone. You can pick it up, but it's also like, it's getting some more content, which I think is good. Cause like you said, we've really enjoyed playing some legends and there's still some content we haven't experienced yet because we are not quite high enough level. Um, but I think especially if, if they're going to make it a standalone purchase, it, it does need a little bit more stuff to do like the campaign is really cool like i was actually blown away by how much content there was as like an add-on um but once you get through the campaign and like the horde or the like defense mode is cool but it does get a little bit repetitive it's, yeah definitely. over it time more of, like you want to play that alongside the other modes i guess right but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly it's just fun to hop into a match every now and again or have a night every now and again to play it so I, I like, I'm glad that they're, they're adding some more stuff to it because I, I want more reasons to go back and play some more legends. So 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's uh, yeah new cosmetics, new maps, uh, and updates to the to the raid as well. I think increasing um, some difficulty for those who are. I'm sure there's a lot of people kind of at max level, so kind of building mm-hmm. that out, making it bigger. But uh, good news. I mean, it all just makes the needle point up for Tsushima in general, right? And of course, as, as excited as I am for the DLC kind of coming out, the director's cut, Icky Island. Um, obviously, we're all waiting for the day Ghost of Tsushima has a full proper, you know, big sequel. So that will be that will be the day. And if this does well, we get that sooner, hopefully. Uh, good for you, Tsushima. And that's going to do us for the news section uh, as well this week. So we'll be right back uh, for the third part of the show right after this. All right, everybody, welcome back to the third and final segment of today's show where we have a fun little exercise we thought we could do, uh, which is pack up a little care package for those uh, those of our listeners who are stuck on desert islands and <laughs> and need a, need a little... I'm, uh, I'm sure there are many of you, yeah, so you know, don't feel forgotten. We know you exist too. <laughs> you're sitting on the beach, you got your, your podcast, the, the last ounce of energy on your phone, you're, you're listening to this episode right now just to get a bit of entertainment and you're just wishing, man, I wish I had a selection of curated games uh, to, to play on this on this island. So that's what we're going to provide for you here today uh, based on a few different categories we're going to go through and just uh, make you a nice little care package, you know, to enjoy yourself while you're foraging for food and surviving on the beach. So um, to start us off, Kate, I wanted to, to each give a game. Now, obviously, there's not a lot to do. I mean, I may- Maybe there is a lot to do on a desert island. You're building a shelter, you know, gathering food. But hypothetically, you're going to be there for a while. And you're going to need a game that you can play a lot. So something that's really endlessly replayable. Um, so so, so, what would you recommend for someone in that situation? Well, there was the low hanging fruit of Slay the Spire. That obviously was the first thing I thought about. Um, but I went with something that I think I would want to play for a longer period of time, if you can believe that. Um, and I picked Into the Breach. Mm. I think that game is just it's endless like it is such a smart strategy game it's something that i go through phases where i pick up and play for a bit every now and again and then i don't touch it for a few months but that game is is phenomenal it's basically a a really like condensed strategy game you have three different units that all have various abilities and you're kind of dealing with like a like a monster infestation and it tell each turn you're on a small grid with different buildings to defend and there's various terrains that do different things and all these monsters pop up and they all have different abilities as well and you basically have your three units that you need to stop them from doing as much damage as possible and make it to the end before enough things get destroyed And it's procedurally generated, so it's different every time you run through it. There's tons of different unit types, so that makes it exciting to hop back in with different squads. And it's just, it's so tight, like, it's so simple. The information, everything's told to you, what the enemies are going to do every single turn, and you just are, like, putting out a fire the whole time. (laughs) And, like, every time I sit down to play this game, I'm like, holy shit, like, this game is so smart. And I think while I love Slay the Spire and it's like got that addictive quality to it, I don't think it's quite as impressive as something like Into the Breach. And if I was going to play this for the next 70 plus years, <laughs> oh man, you're going to live for a long like, time well, I, on the <laughs> island. I mean, on the island, hopefully. I mean, yeah, 70 well, years here in your house. Sure. On look, the island. It's, mm. it's good to be prepared. OK. And this is this is step one to being prepared. <laughs> I love that call. I love Into the Breach as well. It's it's, no, it's just an amazing strategy game. I really don't know how it could really be any better. And you're right, re- replayability wise, not only is it procedurally generated, but it's also really difficult on the higher higher difficulty settings. Yeah. So it would take you a while probably just to just to beat that once or twice. So yeah, good call. Um, I also avoided the low hanging fruit of Slay the Spire, which is literally <laughs> endlessly playable. Um, and I took it a bit of a different route for me. We're t- I'm trying to make some different picks. You know, we all, we all have our go-to mm-hmm. games here. So I, I picked Luminous, actually, um, which is a puzzle game. kind of came on my radar. It just came out on Xbox Game Pass, actually. So it was brought back to my attention. But this, of course, classic PSP game, classic PlayStation puzzle game. Um, I personally think it's better than Tetris. But that's just me. 
Um, I love the way it's it's tied in so musically. Like the the look of this game is just fantastic. The way as you get further into higher waves of difficulty, that the music of the game changes, um, the look of your tiles all change, the, the the pace of the game changes too. Like you'll be um, the way the way that it works is when you connect kind of your blocks that are all the same color. Um, there's this music bar that goes along kind of the to the tempo of the music that you're listening to at that time. And as it goes through, it deletes uh, blocks that are touching of the same color. And so different levels have different speeds. Like you'll one's very slow, and so your blocks don't get deleted very often. You have to play very carefully. Whereas there's some other levels where the music's very fast and your blocks get deleted very very quickly, and you're 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 having a hard time even making some bigger chains because things get deleted so fast. And so um, there's there's just so many different levels you can unlock. There's a puzzle mode. There's there's even a versus mode. I guess if you were to to get into playing that, like it's just got everything in there. I think it's a great game. Um, and something like those type of puzzle games, like Tetris, Luminous. Um, th there's a few others as well. I guess Bejeweled even. Like those games are endlessly replayable in their own way. Um, going for high scores and all that stuff too. So, uh, yeah, Luminous for me. I like it. I better than Tetris is a big call, but you know what? I really hope we do get Luminous ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe then it really will rival Tetris. Maybe not better, um, but I just prefer it. Okay, so okay, so you've introduced us to the concept of maybe you aren't totally alone on this island. You know, Luminous got a multiplayer mode, and it would be nice to have some company. So, say you're stranded together. What would be your multiplayer game? Hmm. Well, again, uh, going on, on the think outside of the box kind of answers here. I'm not going to say Apex. And <clears throat> what I am going <laughs> to say is uh, I'm going to call it a game called Dragon's Crown. I don't think I've talked about this game on the show before. And this one is another genre I don't play a whole lot of, but it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up. Um, it's got a really beautiful hand-drawn art style. I don't know if you've seen this game at all, Kate. Um, it's got got kind of this watercolor aesthetic, uh, hand-drawn character models. Uh, it's up to four players, which is really nice because if you, you know, get in touch with a couple on the island across over from you, uh, those, those two can come over. You can have a nice couple's night playing some Dragon's Crown. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a fun game. There's six different classes you can play. Uh, you can only pick four characters, though, so there's some replayability there. Um, maybe playing again with some different characters. Uh, there's some, also some g randomly generated dungeons as well later in the game, as, although um, the levels themselves are not are not randomly generated, but there is some content like that. Um, there's, you know, the whole aspect of building out your character, leveling up, skill trees, um, unlocking your moves, getting better armor, all that kind of stuff. So you got some replayability there as well, but it's just a fun time going through those kind of games and beating the shit out of some enemies with your friends, you know? So I um, wanted to shout out Dragon's Crown. It's a fun game, and it, and I think it's one not a lot of people have played. So if you get a chance to check it out, um, 100% recommend. Good time. Okay, that's cool. I'm picturing like, uh, yeah, those beat-em-ups are fun. Like, I haven't played one in a long time aside from like Castle Crashers and... That yeah, also not, would have been a good one There's not here. like a lot of those these days. Like Streets of Rage 4 is really the only one I can think of that's been like released in the last couple of years of consequence anyway. Like there's that and then the, the Ninja Turtles one coming out, but that's pretty mm -hmm. much it. River City Girls maybe, but that's that's kind of niche. Anyway, what's your what's your multiplayer game? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I kind of picked everything sort of with the context of like, we're going to be here a while. Like I know, you know, that that's kind of the context of, of being on an island. So... I was thinking, like, what's a game that I would probably want to play for a while? And also, what's a game that I haven't actually played, but always have wanted to and just haven't had the time? And how perfect would that be? So I've actually picked Monster Hunter Worlds. It's oh, a game cool. yeah. I've always wanted to get into and just haven't gotten around to yet. And now, like, I don't have an excuse with it being in the PS Plus collection. I need to start it eventually, but I think it would be a lot more fun to play with someone. I like that idea of, like, you know, like tracking the monster together and like, you know, one person's like, I'll check up this hill and like, I'll check this way. And then you like go and you do those cool fights together. And then you like build your gear up and like, like complimentary outfits and stuff. And I just think like the, the amount of time I think some people have like put into this game, like there's so much grinding, there's so much to do. I think it would be like a perfect multiplayer game. And fitting too, because I mean, you're hunting monsters in real life, like boars and whatever you find on the the desert island. So you're doing that in real life, and you're hunting some more afterwards in the game. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, some good synergy. Maybe yeah. hopefully you just don't get tired of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, but let's just say there's there's no one else around. Like you really are like deserted by yourself. You're you're alone, right? You're gonna start going a bit crazy eventually. You're gonna be talking to yourself. You know, making Wilson or whatever that 
volleyball's name was. You know, you need something <laughs> to keep your mind sharp while you're here on the desert island. Um, and so for that reason, I think it's important to bring something with a really nice story, something you can really sink your mind into, maybe a bit of escapism, you know, to, to get your mind off the sand that's constantly in places you don't want it. Um, and so for that reason, we need a story driven game, Kate. What's a, what's a story driven game you'd like to bring along for those quiet moments? Um, okay. So I got to shout out Divinity Original Sin 2 here because like, oh my God, that's the game I would hundred percent take. Um, but I think what I actually want to talk about just for some variety is, Red Dead Redemption 2. Mm. This is like a phenomenal game that we really haven't covered much on the show and, and maybe we should in more maybe depth we should. another maybe time. Maybe we should. Um, it would help if I played it. Yeah, you should really should. And it would help if I finished it too. Um, <laughs> it's a game I really need to jump back into, but it is it is such a long game. There is so much going on. There are so many characters that, that are interesting that you get to know and that camp dynamic and how Arthur fits into it. But... I genuinely think he's one of the most interesting characters in games. And especially if you've played the first game and, and how it builds on the story that was told there. Red Dead Redemption 2 is just an absolutely like immersive game. Like you could spend hours just running around hunting and doing like generic like camp activities. Um, but then when you actually do engage with the story, like it's really touching. It's a really interesting kind of look at the way of life that is changing for these people and they don't know how to adapt to how things are moving forward. Nice. That's a good call, actually. And another one where you can have a lot of time spent there as well, which is which is nice. Um, so for me, I took this away of like, hmm, what's a game that I really love the story of and I really enjoyed playing, but I just haven't played in forever, like something I'd maybe get a bit of nostalgia from, right? Be missing home, uh, stranded wherever I am. So I went with Final Fantasy X, which is one of my favorite RPGs of all time. Uh, played it back on the PS2. It was one of my first PS2 games when I picked that system up. So kind of blast from the past, very fitting for the podcast. Um, but it's a great mm -hmm. game. I really enjoyed Final Fantasy X a lot. Um, I think the cutscenes has got that horrible laughter scene and like the iconic <laughs> swimming romance scene. So there's some there's some funny moments in there. Um, and it's just a it's an interesting story, right? Like it was it's kind of about this cast of characters that gets put together, um, similar to whatever JRPG you want to talk about. But they're they're helping this one girl, Yuna, on her pilgrimage to go and like become the next. Um, I guess she's like a savior of the world in some senses with the church and some some stuff that goes on. She has these trials she needs to complete all over the world and you have to escort her there basically. And just the bonds the characters make, the the humor I think is pretty funny despite some of the, the voice acting and great combat system as well. So just a great, great RPG, which I really, really like. And I would really like to replay this as well because um, so at the time when this game came out, obviously I played it on PS2 and PS, uh, they, they did some remasters of this game on PlayStation 3, so I went and bought that. I pre-ordered it, actually. Um, got that, started playing it, and then, like, right after that PS3 remaster came out, and I'd already spent the money on it, they also they also did a PlayStation 4 remaster of the game, and I felt so Aww. burned, because I was like, well, fuck, like, I just bought this, this remastered version specifically to replay this, and then the new one comes out. I was just so choked, and so I'd love to take specifically the PS4 remaster <laughs> and finally play that on the desert island. Um, yes, and yeah. then and then the second you do that, there's a PS5 remaster. That's right. I'm just oh, it's <laughs> happened again. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. Um. Well, that that is that is unfortunate. Um. You know what though? We should take a second back, a step back. We got another game we might want to talk about, but we got to be honest with what's going on out here. It is rough. We're on a desert island. That's not a good situation to be in. And really, it's it's probably dangerous probably scary so you need to survive out here and to learn how to survive out in the real world you need to play a survival game to teach you the right kind of mindset and some skills so what kind of survival game would you bring with you this was the hardest one for me to come up with because I just haven't really played a lot of survival games. And I know there's like the whole horror survival thing. And I and I kind of thought about those, but I was like, man, you know, am I really going to want to play something really scary while I'm also fearing for my life, you know, living out in this horrible situation? So probably not. Um, I went with Don't Starve Together. Uh, it was something I thought about for the multiplayer game, but then also I just, you know, it's a very fitting thing for this category too. And so um, it's, it's a good game. Like I, I've had a lot of fun playing uh, don't starve together. It's very challenging, like knowing what to do and kind of what to craft, but you're, you're kind of just, you appear in this, this place and you're just gathering resources, you're building shelters, you're 
um, you know, building weapons, finding different resources around in the different biomes and similar to stuff you'd be doing, I guess, on a desert island. So um, align really nicely there. But Don't Starve, I think, is a game that just is kind of one of those ever present games that no one talks about. But for some reason, when you go online and like see what's going on, like there's always people playing it. There's there's a pretty big community. So um, I, I really like that game a lot. The art style is very unique as well. It's got almost like a like a Tim Burton-y or kind mm-hmm. of kind of look to it so uh yeah just wanted to most, mostly shout out don't starve and hopefully um we wouldn't starve playing this game or on the desert <laughs> island very good um this was probably the hardest one for me too just because yeah survival games are not really a genre i play too much i didn't even think about horror survival games so that was so totally out the window but um you know when you're you're on an island your instinct is to swim away you ask that question as if it's like as if i've been in this situation <laughs> that's right just casually oh, you know when you've been on, you've been on an island before you like you know when that happens yeah yeah, yeah every time again like every couple months or so but you're like i should swim away because you know like that's how you get off of this place is i should make a boat i should swim away the water is my is my best friend but that's a trap because the water is not your best friend there's creatures in there you can't swim that far you're gonna get tired can't even drink it you can't even drink it don't go in the water so to discourage me from falling to that trap i'm gonna bring subnautica with me Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and the real reason here is because out of all the survival games this is the one that has a bit of my interest um and partially maybe just that underwater setting is so different and partially i've just heard people say really good things about this game i know a lot of people are excited for the sequel that's that's coming out and so this one just kind of has that that bit of like my curiosity is peaked right like i want to see what someone's done with an underwater game and actually made something that's a really fun place to to explore and to to live in for a period of time so i think um i think yeah i'd I'd be under the water in in subnautica with the monster whatever lives down there (laughs) fair enough okay um, so we're, we're getting close to the end here. We got two more games left to put in our, our care package of, of desert Island games. And, you know, one thing that's very important to keep in mind when you're trying to survive somewhere is you always got to keep in mind a goal, right? You, you can't just let yourself kind of become unmotivated and, and, um, you know, just lose all your hope. So you really have to be working towards something. And in the same way, you really need a game to be a project for you. You need something you can work on. And so you need something that's going to be a platinum for you to chase, something with a lot of trophies maybe, or, you know, just a, just something you can feel really accomplished when you've done it. Just like when you build that first shelter uh, the first night of your, your stranded stay on the, on the island, uh, you got a platinum you can work towards as well. So what's a game uh, that has a platinum trophy you would like to obtain um, on the island? So I've I've cheated and brought two because I couldn't decide which one I liked more. But I figure you'll let me get away with it because I've unintentionally made this like two perfect picks for you. <laughs> okay, okay. And so the first one I'm bringing is Yakuza 0 because uh-huh. I really want to play that game. And I know it's known for having a bunch of really funny trophies because like there's all like the regular mission stuff you do, but there's tons of like silly little like side games and like goofy things that you can get up to in, in that world. So I think that like playing all the arcade games and doing all like the dumb stuff would be like fun trophies to try 100%. to go after. Um, and the other one I'm going for is Heavy Rain, which is a game I know <laughs> you platinumed. Um, and the draw for that is there's so many different ways that the story can go because you're making choices as you play the, through the. It's kind of like a like a murder mystery sort of like a a whodunit kind of like detective game and you play as a a few different characters and you're playing through the game and trying to solve the mystery solving the murder and various scenes go differently depending on what you choose to do or just how you execute something because there's some quick time events if you don't do something perfectly like there might be consequences characters even die depending on on how you run through the game so there's tons of different endings there's tons of different ways that characters come to the conclusion at the end and so the trophies are all about um how you navigate through the game itself which is kind of cool because it encourages you to to see all of the content and see the like well what if what if i'd done this instead i love the call on heavy rain that's just so perfect <laughs> um yakuza too interestingly enough because i uh pick judgment is my game <laughs> which is obviously <laughs> from the same franchise um yeah, there's just so much to do in those games, you know, like if you really want to go for the platinum, 
you absolutely have to put in so much time. Like not only is it a new game plus kind of situation for the story wise, but also like, man, there's just so many different mini games. Like with judgment, of course, there's the drone flying mini game. There's uh, that you run like the cabarets and the underground nightclubs. There's just so many options you have to do. Um, and just like com- going through and completing like those different missions of like eat at this many different restaurants, you know, get a high score in all these different uh, different games you've got to go through in the arcades, like beat up these guys, obviously get through the story. There's just endless stuff. And it's one of the few games kind of of that length where I feel like a lot of the side content is interesting enough or there's something funny in there or there's just something going on with it that mean- makes it more meaningful to complete the side stuff than, than a lot of other games kind of of that 40, 50 hour length, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Judgment, Yakuza, all great choices, uh, Heavy Rain too. It's perfect. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Um, I think we've done really well so far, but there's one question we had left. And I think so far we've really been, we've taken this very seriously. And this is legitimately how your experience would go on a desert island. Like, we've covered everything. This is, you know, how you'd survive. And, you know, like, it's very, very organic and intuitive to a desert island. Um, but I think we just need to take one step back because, you know, the, it's going to be gonna be there a long time. The days are going to sort of blend into each other. Um, and you're going to need a kind of something to reset you and just kind of take you out of, of your regular life for a moment and just, you know, give you that peace, that that something different that really cleanses your palate. And so we need a breath of fresh air game. What are you bringing to really like reset and, you know, give you that like, oh, that was that was really unusual. I'm going to remember that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I don't know if I would say this qualifies like all of those different descriptions. But to me, when I'm thinking of a palate cleanser game, I want something smaller, like a bite sized little experience. You can kind of toss on for a day, finish it or get close to that, you know get through it like that so i saw recently like a short hike is coming to playstation after being i I don't know if it's steam exclusive or if it's on switch or or whatever but it's coming to playstation and i really just want to shout it shout this game out it's another game takes place on an island right desert island short Mm -hmm. hike takes place on an island and the premise is you're this little bird um and you're at your grandma's house or something on on this um far away island so you don't really have a lot of friends there you not much is going on and you're you kind of just left to entertain yourself and so you you start at your grandma's house on the island and she's at the foot of this big big mountain and the mechanics are just very similar to like breath of the wild exploration like your your stamina and also because you're a bird um you can glide so you're kind of climbing and gliding to get your way and work your way up this mountain as the game goes and you're you're, you're doing things to increase your stamina you're you're gliding you're you're completing little fetch quests for a different cute animal friend people you meet on the island and you're you're kind of working your way up to these different peaks of height and and um seeing kind of how far you can climb and at the same time completing these quests you can climb higher and get further and it's just this really nice cycle of exploration it's only a couple couple hours long to complete a few more if you want to get you know see everything do everything but it's just a really really great little game like tight little um little experience you know i would recommend to anyone i had a i had a blast playing this a couple of years ago on steam and so uh definitely check it out on ps4 if you're looking for a palate cleanser uh such as this so yeah short hike how about you kate okay my mine's a little bit of a longer hike i think um i went for something that was a bit more unique was kind of the the keyword i went for something that just felt like a very different gaming experience so i went with the witness which is mm-hmm. that phenomenal puzzle game that came out um, a few years back. And anyone who has played it will know exactly what I'm talking about. And anyone who has not played this game or is not really familiar with the concept, I really urge you just to go look it up because it's it's hard to picture if you don't know exactly what the game's all about and, and how it lays out. But basically, you're on an island. Haha, <laughs> already a good start. Um, and there's no direction, nothing. You're just there one day and the whole island itself is just a bunch of interconnected puzzles and so you walk around interacting with various things on the island and solving different types of puzzles and kind of figuring out what's going on on this island in the same in the same time but what makes this game unique is that it doesn't give you any direction and it doesn't explain anything it relies on you to figure out everything that's happening. So there's no keys to any of these puzzles. There's no 
text boxes, there's no dialogue, there's no nothing that gives you any kind of context or direction or any sort of help to solve any of this. And it's a little overwhelming at first, but you just figure out what you're supposed to do. And the game is, has the philosophy of like, how do we teach someone without directly teaching them anything? And it provides you with all the, all the resources you need through things like the environment or through putting things in a, in a sequence so that you're building up your knowledge from previous puzzles. And there's a little bit of trial and error and there's a little bit of like, you know, trying to, to make leaps in your logic, but it is just that one step further removed than a lot of puzzle games are where not a lot of times they don't have like text box that pop up and say like, this is what this does in the puzzle. Please use this to solve the, you know, the next issue. And like, mm -hmm. there's always that level of having to intuitively grasp what you're intended to do with the resources you have. But this game, like, just takes that one step further backwards and really, like, makes you feel like you're putting all these pieces together and solving, and not just solving puzzles, but, like, understanding how the puzzle works at all. Right, yeah. Is, is really interesting. And so, like, if you like puzzle games or, like, you just kind of want something different, like, I really urge, like, go look up this game. Like, I've never seen anything quite like it. I've never had an experience quite like it. It was, like... It must be like what a Mensa member feels like to just live an <laughs> it makes you feel life. real smart. Real smart. <laughs> makes you to feel those out. real smart. And I think it's just one of those things where like you just every now and again you this is the kind of game where like it absorbs your whole life, but like you can't play it for long periods of time because like you just need that like almost like mental clarity to come back and be like, oh hang on, I see I see what I need to look at now, but like I just need that different perspective. So like the perfect game to just every now and again you come back and you're like oh i'm looking at it differently like it's just clicked in my mind and i don't know it's just it's, it's like, so refreshing it's so weird it's so fun though that game looks really interesting I, it was on ps plus a little while back too right i think mm -hmm. i think we have it, it. I, I, I don't know if i downloaded it with the intention to start but it's definitely one of those like i do want to go back and play it at some point um yeah it just looks really interesting i know a lot of people have very high opinions of that game so yeah, good choice. Mm -hmm. Um so that's that's our Desert Island games, Kate. Those are the games we would like to run uh like everyone to play. If you ever are in a situation where you're stuck on an island, you know, take these games with you. Uh maybe a mix and match some of Kate and I's answers, but you're going to have a good time and trust me, you're going to get rescued one day. Just keep playing these games and have a good time, okay? Um but uh since you're not on a desert island yet, hopefully uh you can stick around and listen to us uh answer one listener mail question before we take off for the day. Uh, which we will read out now. Um, yeah, so we had Jazz right in, um, which is wonderful. And he had a fun prompt, um, just totally open for creativity. He said, if you could create a game, give us a quick pitch on what it would be. Is it a roguelike, an RPG, an on-rail shooter? Be as generic or as detailed as you want. And that is so kind to be so flexible for us. <laughs> and, <laughs> I appreciate that flexibility. And, uh, I specifically love, and James, will you give us as many details as you want or just be very generic <laughs> whatever works just, <laughs> please i'm sorry like it's fine <laughs> we're really leaving it open to our whatever our interpretation of this game is maybe you only just started workshopping it maybe it's been something on your mind for years and years you know like mm -hmm. some creative thing but yeah thank you for your question jazz and, and like i said at the top of the show if you want to be like jazz and write us a question uh we always need more we really need some more now uh, you can send them over again to circles and squares pod at gmail.com um, or send it to our Twitter at C A N D S pod on Twitter. You can find all our stuff there. Uh, send us some great questions just like this one. Um, Kate, do you want to start? Do you want to tackle this first? Do you want me to go? What are you um, feeling? You know what? You, you go ahead. I want to hear about yours. Maybe it'll sure. inspire me for sure. more elements of mine. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay. So man, this is, this is almost like, you know, when you get that creative freedom and you're like, oh my God, there's so much things I can, so many things I can choose from. Like, what am I going to do? And then I, I kind of had this thought. I was like, you know what? If I really, because I have no idea how to make games, right? Like I'm not a programmer. I don't do this stuff. If I was to make any game, what would I want to make? It would, it would, I would want to make Persona 6. See, we know how much I love Persona 5. <laughs> what does Persona 6 look like if I got to design the sequel to my favorite game? And I'll tell you what it looks like. First of all, uh, Persona games always have a color scheme to them. This mm -hmm. Persona game will be green, which is my favorite color because we've had, uh, you know, it was yellow with Persona 4, Persona 5 red, 
Uh, this one will be green. I think one of the other ones was blue. I don't know. Whatever. This is mm -hmm. a green one, okay? But the unique <laughs> thing about this Persona game is that it is going to be have a element of card based combat and deck building to it, uh, which I think would be super super awesome. So I think like you know in Persona Five, we'll use it as the example. I guess just because it's probably the most played Persona game, it definitely is. Um, you have kind of the the turn based combat, and you're collecting all these different personas. You know, they're basically your different move sets, different move sets for your character and i think what would be really cool is if uh these were you when you captured the new personas they were cards instead of just a monster you could summon right and to, this actually works because persona 4 like when it you had the cards it had cards like the personas were cards that's what exactly. you threw them out as kind exactly. of exactly like the, the tarot card kind of theme so i thought you could you could have the cards this time and and you'd have to you have a certain amount of cards i guess you'd bring in your deck and so you'd have to build it out with what personas you'd want to bring and synergize their their cards and i thought maybe there could be like the top of the card is a is a different persona and using the top function would like switch which persona you have and then the bottom could be like different moves based on what persona you've equipped basically like an attack or are they healing or, or like what is their support move or something like that so there could be like a deck building aspect um, maybe you would build a deck for each of the characters you get in your party and so you could play them a little bit differently if you wanted to put like you know more of their attack cards and less of their support cards or something um, i think that would just be a really cool cool system it's got that element of capturing a lot of different creatures but still putting its own un unique twist um, i would also really like to see some some um, kind of action elements introduced to the battle system so something like bug fables had this or paper mario or yakuza like a dragon i'm playing right now too is like if you time you've timed button presses you do during combat which can do more or less damage and i would love to see some of that um put into persona it's got some some of that lightly i guess with like tapping your gun as fast as you can with x and some stuff in royal but i would love to see that uh, kind of lined up along with a new card system for battling be uh really really fun um, the last thing I want to see for the new Persona mm -hmm. game, if I was making it, I could get anything I wanted, would be uh, some some like light narrative choices, you know, like you could maybe pick um, in some of the Persona games you get to pick and in, in four you get to pick. Do you want to join the basketball team? Do you want to join the uh, what is it running team or there's no, another running sport? Five. Volleyball? It's like volleyball. volleyball. Yeah. So like depending on which of those you were to pick, maybe you would get a different optional party member in, in your uh, group and you could have like one or two different choices where you have to pick, oh no, someone has to die in your party in this choice. You lose them and you get to, you know, just stuff like that. Make everyone's party a bit different. Switch it up. Mm -hmm. Give us some give us some new stakes. And so I think if you included all those different ideas and got some polish and, and everything that we've seen from especially uh, P4, P5, I think this would be incredibly special and I would be addicted forever. Okay, I like it. I'm telling you right now, I will play this game. I <laughs> want this to not be Persona 6 because I want Persona 6 to come out. I trust they're going to do a great job. But for this to be like a spin-off Persona title right, and I okay. want to play both of them. It could be a spin-off of 5 it. too. It could be a, It could be anything. Like mm -hmm. just, a, just a Persona game with a deck building. You well, know. Yeah. Atlas said that they have like 20 things to announce in the next like month or so. So like, you never know, maybe there's a card game. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to get my hopes up very high, but there is a possibility we can't count it out. So everyone mm -hmm. cross your fingers with me, say a little prayer and we will, we'll see what we can get done. Okay. I'll call Atlas after the podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, while you're doing that, if you want to pitch them, if they love your game and they want a second one. Um, and you're not sure what to say, I'll give you a quick rundown of what I think would be cool. And so I was kind of thinking in a similar sort of fashion, like what kind of game would I want to play that doesn't exist? And I want more whodunit like murder mystery games because my friend Zane and I played through all of Danganronpa and we absolutely loved it. We had a blast. Phenomenal. And we started Paradise Killer the other day and it's kind of cool, but it... It's not really scratching the persona itch for, or sorry, not persona. Um, it's definitely not Dangan scratching the persona no, itch. <laughs> not scratching the persona itch. And it's not really scratching the dang and rompa itch that we were hoping for. And so we're kind of like looking in that genre for their games. And I just want more of them in general. But then I was kind of thinking about like, well, what would I want to add to a game like that if I could? So I want it to be like a murder mystery whodunit kind of thing. And you're like with, tracking down the killer. With a parry mechanic. Yes. Well, <laughs> that's exactly you know you make that joke but that's exactly what i've done <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> well, okay see here's the thing it. is those games are always like very narrative and text driven and that's fine because it works really well 
But I was like, what if what if we were able to add some more gameplay to it? Like, so you still have all like the talking scenes. You still get those like awesome courtroom dramas where you're putting your evidence in at the right time and like proving people are, are lying. And that's really exciting. But also what if in the explore, like the exploration scene in the other half where you're, you're like tracking down clues and things, like maybe that has a little bit more of a gameplay element. So I was thinking what could be cool is um, you sort of like, you find some kind of evidence and then when you're investigating the evidence, you actually like, go to a different st style of game and you play as the killer who left behind this evidence but you don't know who it is like he's a shadowy figure like you're playing through it it's like the deduction in your mind but you play it out and then depending on what kind of evidence you found is a different type of gameplay so it's like well how did he get in here like this room was supposed to be locked and so like maybe it's like a stealth section and then you have to like pick mm. the there's like a pick the lock mini game and then it's like, oh, he's murdered someone and like, it looked like a brutal fight. And then you have to fight them and you have a parry and a dodge roll. <laughs> and like, I can and then see it's it like, now. And then it's like an action scene. So like different evidence would either have like longer gameplay sections or even just like little mini games added to them. And I think that would contextualize the mini games more fun than just like, oh man, like I don't know how to spell the word knife. I better drive this taxi to learn how to spell the word knife so that <laughs> I can move left and right on my surfboard so I can pick the correct letters I need. <laughs> exactly. Like the dang and rough ones were fun, but they were just so like weird. They had no reason. They didn't make any sense. And it was just like fun, wacky, weird games you played. And this kind of takes that a step further, but also like adds to you actually making sense as to how this might have played out. And then your evidence collecting side of it is actually like various different types of, of cool like action and or stealth and or various like gameplay. And then you go to the court scene and you have that awesome drama and, and it just kind of flows between these two different states. That sounds really like a really good game, honestly, because stuff like Danganronpa, the, it's let down by how boring the overworld is, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not fun at all to walk around. Like I, I would rather just have it like Phoenix Wright where there's a menu and you just click like, where do you want to go? Like, that to me is a lot better. So I like what you're throwing down. It, it almost seems to me like your proposal is kind of like what judgment could have been if judgment was more focused on because judgment is very action focused. And then there's the mm -hmm. like some of the court stuff and some dialogue stuff, but it's very light in that. So it almost would be like if judgment was flipped to be a little bit more courtroom stuff, but then also some action mm -hmm. on the side. Like, man, good combination. <laughs> Both good combinations, I would say. Persona plus cards and Danganronpa plus action scenes. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's great. What a world we live in if these were, were to be real, hey? Mm -hmm. I think I somebody needs to get in touch with us and make these games. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if like... you're listening to this podcast and you're a game developer, uh, hit us up. Take our ideas and give us mm -hmm. some credit. We'll take like 5% royalty or something. Real low, you know, like just to just make, make a mm -hmm. little bit of income. That's all we need. Exactly. I just want this to exist because like, I'm like, I got to play judgment is basically what it comes down to. Because I'm standing here like, I'm so like geared up, ready to go. I'm like, I don't fuck cancel my plans later. I got to play this game. I'm so excited. It doesn't exist. But maybe I play judgment and that's, that's <laughs> what I'm looking for. <laughs> maybe so. You, you, I guess uh, you'll have to borrow my desk. We'll see. I'll get it. I'll get it over to you sometime. We'll see. Uh, but I think that's going to close us out for the show this week, Kate. So once again, thank you for joining me so much. And once again, thank you to all of our beautiful listeners for giving us your time and, and inviting us into your, your day. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, again, send us in some listener mail questions uh, to our email address. All the links are below. And until next time, we will see you on the next episode. The intro and outro music for Circles and Squares was produced by friend of the show, Matthew Chan. Interlude music is from Scott Grattan of the Free Music Archive. Our channel art was created by at Unreasonable on Twitter, and our brother Alex is the designer of the Circles and Squares logo. Thank you all for listening and supporting the show.